Enough messing around. It's time to get to the bottom. Who killed this 200? So to say the process of getting this car running again has been a journey would be putting it pretty lightly. I'm gonna show you right now what I've had to do just to try to keep track of everything that has gotten us to this point. That's like three pages long of notes on everything we've done to get here to get you to this point. So um, what I want to do is go over pretty much the entire process as it happened, mostly for the sake of, hey, maybe somebody else has a 200 that doesn't run. Or, you know, any other car, really, because essentially what we did is what you would want to do with any car. But this one in particular, with the two plugs per cylinder, a little extra spicy, but there's worse than this out there. So first off, we bought the car with a known condition that it had no spark. There was some kind of ignition issue here. So let's just briefly gift you up to speed on the things that we've done to this point. Uh, we put a new ignition tumbler in, basically a new key set, uh, because it was busted out in order to get it running for whoever had it going last. Uh, and that left some wires disconnected in there, which was enough for me to think, hey, maybe maybe this thing has some kind of security feature on it and that's why it's got no ignition. Not the case. After we gave the thing a quick once over, made sure that the timing belt wasn't snapped and that it had compression, that it turned over at all and that kind of stuff, that began the process of seeing, well, where are we actually? Does it run? And indeed, it would turn over very nicely, but it would never even hint that it was firing. Interestingly, the gauge cluster does not work either, so it's hard to know well, how much is going on. But we could hear that the fuel pump worked, so that was a pretty good sign that the ECU works. So that led us to the point of basically testing to make sure it had no spark, and that was indeed the case. I would put a, you know, I put my timing light on the number one lead and tested it that way, but I also pulled a plug and, you know, visibly saw that it had no spark. I also noted when doing that that the car has brand new spark plugs in it on the intake side. Not exactly the case on the exhaust side. But they're not old either. Like, that's a good plug, right? Yeah, except for that. So, I don't know. That's not an age thing. That's that's uh, somebody's been in here and been messing with this thing and, you know, broke the spark plug thing. So we do have the factory service manual for this car, and that is extremely helpful because a lot of this stuff is, you know, it's it's ancient <laughs> to us these days. Uh, it's more than 35 years old, and a lot of it's just kind of irrelevant to modern cars, but some of it's pretty similar. There's actually extensive processes in the factory service manual for diagnosing a no-spark issue. The first of which is basically verifying that there is a good connection between the ECU and the coils. So it has you check for continuity in between pins on the ECU harness. ECU on these cars is located in the driver's footwell. Currently it's sitting there, but it actually sits up in the footwell there. And you've got three connectors here. I know it kind of looks like two, but this one is basically where it's getting all of its power from. This is like, the, we'll say, chassis side. This middle one here is where the ignition leads actually were. And this last one seems to be where it contains most of the fuel stuff. That's not a hard and fast rule, but that's just generally how it's laid out. So from there, it was time to start looking at the coil situation. So this car has an intake side coil and an exhaust side coil. I'll have to find some footage here to show you that the way that this was, one of them just kind of dangling in the engine bay, and one that was still mounted to the car. The one that was mounted to the car was the actual intake side coil. Interestingly though, that was not the coil that was hooked up to the distributor. The one that was hooked up to the distributor was the exhaust coil. But the exhaust coil was hooked up to an intake coil. Did you follow that? This is an intake side coil assembly for this car. You can tell that it is because it has this extra lead right here. This extra lead is the tack signal out. So the exhaust side one will not have that. There's no provision on the wiring harness to hook that up. 
And that would go vaguely down there. Let me try to get some light on it for you. There you go. So you can see right there is the mount for the exhaust side coil. Currently, we do not have that hooked up. Uh, we'll get to there. It should be said though, although this car has two coils and two spark plugs per cylinder, it doesn't need them. It will run absolutely with just the intake side coils and spark plugs functional. The European models of this engine don't even feature the exhaust side. That isn't to say that you should just run the intake side because the ECU is tuned to use both sets and it will start to use the exhaust side above 4,000 RPM. We've heard various different ranges, but it does use them. It is tuned to use them. Would it be absolutely fine without them? Maybe, but that's not for me to determine. So the first thing that I wanted to do was basically mount the coil in the car correctly. So I took the intake coil that was sitting in the engine bay and I mounted it down onto the pad there where it belongs, just to make sure that it wasn't a simple grounding issue that was causing it not to start. Turns out, didn't matter. That was no good. But the story didn't really end with the coils being mounted incorrectly. Oh, no, no, no. Somebody tried to get this car working, and they were trial by firing it or something. So this is the car as it sits now. Currently, there's only four spark plug wires and one coil wire hooked up, as we are currently using just the intake coil. However, with all eight spark plug wires on there and two coil wires, it gets a little confusing. Confusing enough, in fact, that when I looked to replace the spark plug wires, because, again, they were cheap, literally they were $7 for a really nice set of spark plug wires, um, I was very baffled to find that the coil intake port, if you would call it, the connector, was hooked up to the exhaust spark plug number one, and every spark plug wire was just in disarray and everywhere. So even if we did have a working coil, it was never going to run. So that begs the question, did it not run because they just had the firing order wrong? Well, probably not, because the coils were testing bad, or sorry, the coil igniters were testing bad. But it's still a little piece of evidence to try and figure out what happened here. So we turn again to the FSM. The FSM has all of the information you need on how to check if these things are any good. And it's not. <laughs> Basically, both of these assemblies were testing bad. Not the coils, which I did replace. I replaced both coils because they're cheap, they're plentiful, they're basically off-the-shelf items, so we threw new coils on both assemblies, but the coil won't do anything if the igniter module, which is essentially a transistor right there, isn't telling the coil to fire. Now, it could be that the ECU is not telling it to fire, or it could be that the little igniter module there is bad. That little sucker right there is about $180. And it needs two of them. So after both of those tested bad, and you would test them through the pins, uh, basically checking continuity between pins and to the ground of the unit, uh, both of them checked bad. Uh, it, I mean, it was obvious that we needed to find a replacement for that because if those were testing bad, we're, we're hosed, like it's never gonna run. We briefly thought about, let me try and find these parts. I'm sure they're somewhere in this. This whole process has left my garage a mess. Here it is, got it. So we briefly considered trying to pull these apart and put new transistors in them because this little guy right here, that's what's probably bad. Like it's literally just that little guy, which is, you know, it's probably a jelly bean part. We're trying to figure out which jelly bean part, not easy. It's at that point that our master of the internet, ZK, discovered that there was perhaps a workaround to not use these very expensive igniters that are getting very hard to find, and if anything did go wrong with them in the future, we'd probably never find again. These little guys here pretty much got phased out after this car. They stopped using them. They used them on this, the 300ZX, the 280ZX, a lot of Nissan Datsuns of the era. They moved on to something very familiar to me, this. This is a more modern unit by relative standards used throughout the 90s 
the PRW-2 is basically going to do the same exact thing as that igniter. And in fact, this is a very common mod to Z31s, we found out. Z31s use this igniter, and they are faulty. They go bad, and they don't perform very well, apparently. So there's actually kits you can buy to just upgrade your car to work with that igniter. This is not that car, though. The plugs are different. But that doesn't stop us from going that route. All right. This is a coil and igniter. This is off a 1993 hard body. So off a Nissan pickup truck, we are getting a PRW-2 and a connector, a pigtail. This has three wires coming out of it. But wait a minute, this only has two wires coming out of it. Well, it's actually not that bad. And in fact, if you were going to do this, I would highly recommend getting one of these complete units from a junkyard. You know, hopefully they leave the pigtails on there for you because it's going to have a bracket that adapts to this PRW-2. This isn't grounded to this, but it does use it as a heat sink. So this unit can overheat if it's not properly mounted to a piece of metal like that to help disperse some heat. Now at the time, I did not get one of these. All I got was one of these and a pigtail. So basically the the kind of connector that goes into this, plus three wires coming out of it. That's enough though to basically get us started towards converting this to a modern igniter. Sorry, a more modern igniter. This is coming out of the main harness of the car. So you can see there that there's a blue and white and a black and white. Just like before, one is gonna be your ECU signal and that's gonna be the blue, and one is gonna be your 12 volt constant that is your black and white. And when I say constant, I mean, you know, when key is on, engine's running. The same can be found down here. There's a blue, solid, and a black and white. That comes up to a connector like this. I've gone ahead and basically discarded this connector because these two pin spade connectors, A, they don't have any positive retention. They just rely on friction and I'm just not a big fan of them. And B, finding the male end of one of these was pretty much impossible. So I went ahead and just cut those wires and put in a, well, you know, a modern weather tight connection there and just put those wires down to those, not the way I would love to do it, but it will work. It's functional. The thing I hate about that is that now we have, you know, a blue wire going to a red wire, which I'm sure many people will gripe about, but don't get it right, get it running. Somebody famous on the internet says that. Uh, so, blue now goes to red, but don't worry, it goes back to blue. So that is your ECU signal. And black goes to black, goes to the OEM plug of the coil. So that's the OEM harness that exists on that. And the black wire, the black and white, now is hooked up to the black of there. That's your 12 volt constant. And the blue one goes into this igniter module. And here it is, the igniter module. So there's the new unit, and there's that pigtail I was talking about. So we'll reference this as connector up. Right is the signal to the ECU. That's gonna to go to the engine harness. Middle is a earth ground, so it's just gonna be you know, a ground right to the body, which I have it there. And the left one is to the coil. So this is the coil driver. So that wire there, now is connected to one end of the plug of the back of the coil. So basically out of the engine harness you have a blue that's going to go to your igniter and a black that's going to go to the coil and then the other side of that igniter. And if your colors don't seem like they match up quite right, here's an easier way to reference that. So the driver, the one that's coming from the left side of that igniter, that is coming from the top of the T here. The constant is the leg of the T. Currently, I don't have a nice fancy mount for this guy. I'm hoping to pick up another one of these brackets, or maybe I'll just fashion something off of that one. But it will run without it. It just, you know, we won't run it for very long because it would get hot. And that's everything. You can convert to this igniter just like that. Fun story, after doing that, it still didn't run. Nothing. Zero spark. Absolutely zero indication that anything was happening. 
So where do we go from there? Oh, we find our good friend, once again, the FSM. And the FSM is going to tell us, hey, is the ECU actually telling the coil to do anything? And here's where it gets fun. This is supposed to have 12 volt constant with the key on and a ground. And that's just what it had. This is the exhaust coil. This side here should have the same thing. This one showed 12 volts. This one showed 12 volts. So something not right there. Why would it be telling the coil basically to fire all the time? Which is a fun little aside, because when I plugged everything in the first time, the coil got smoking hot. So where do we go from there? Now it's time to look at the ECU. What's the ECU look like? Well, it's this brick. It kind of looks very similar to the 240s that I've had in the past. The only difference is they actually print the, uh, the like diagram of the codes right on the ECU. Very convenient. So instantly this started to look a little sus to us. Am I allowed to say sus? Am I allowed to say sus at 36 years old? I think so, because it's probably irrelevant by now. So we noticed that it had a little bit of corrosion on it. Definitely some water has run down this thing. However, these ECU cases, they're sealed tight. No, I promise, even though there's giant holes in the side of it, <laughs> they're sealed pretty tight. So I wasn't overly concerned about it, but we did open it up on stream in order to see if something looked bad in there. We never did find anything bad in the ECU, and maybe we could, maybe there isn't anything bad in the ECU. Don't know. But we did find another ECU on eBay, and that ECU was listed for a 1984 or 85 200SX CA20E. Well, that's not going to help us, because that's a completely different engine, non-turbo, and the, the pinout is totally different. Internet Superstar ZK noticed that the pictures of the ECU matched a turbo model, as did the part number. So whoever listed it just listed it wrong, thankfully, in our favor. Because sure enough, ba -ba -da -ba, that... As you can see, it has junkyard writing on it. That is the ECU for this car. So we plugged that sucker right on in to make sure that, you know, all of our hard work was justified and the, the cost and all of that stuff and all this wonderful digging. And we check the coil driver. And wouldn't you know it, both coils are showing positive and ground. No more showing positive and positive on uh, the intake coil. So it should fire right up, right? We put on the new spark plugs, we put them in the right order, and we go to turn the key. Nothing. Zero spark. Not even, I, I would hook a spark plug directly to the coil. Nothing. Zero spark. Not to worry, what does the trusty FSM say? There's one last piece of this puzzle. There's only one other thing left in the entire ignition system. It's in here. This is the distributor, and back here, is the crank angle sensor. So this determines the engine position for the ECU to know when to fire the cylinders. So we went ahead and checked to make sure that the crank angle sensor had all of its connections. It had a 12 volt, it had a ground. It had the other two basically with continuity to the engine harness. All of this is available in the FSM. The actual crank angle sensor itself lives deep inside the distributor, but you can get to it without a press or anything like that. Like it all unscrews and unbolts, thankfully. This is that little dude. This is the crank angle sensor. So this works with two little light sensors inside of there to determine whether or not, or basically determine where the position of the engine is. One of them is dumb and one of them is smart. That's the best way I can describe it to you. Uh, basically, one of them is reading many, many, many... Actually, I stole one out of the 240 so I can show it to you. Man, now I feel so vindicated for not reinstalling this. <laughs> it was a really stupid mistake on my part, but there it is. Okay, so you can see the outer ring, many, many, many little slots, and the inner ring is basically three small ones and one big. And the three small one big is a more rudimentary, you know, engine position, and the small ones are the more exacting position. And through a lot of effort, which required sending power and ground to this side of it, 
<laughs> I actually wrote on it so I could remember. Uh, so we would send, you know, power and ground to the side of it and then be able to see that signal as we rotated the disc by hand to see that this crank angle sensor was no good. One of them was working, the fine one was not. I know what you're thinking. How is it possible that this car had a blown ECU, it had blown coil igniters, and it has a blown crank angle sensor? That seems like too much. I know, I thought the same thing. But it all makes sense. Trust me, maybe, kinda. So the next day, ordered a new crank angle sensor. Thankfully, these still exist. They are still available at 000 O'Reilly's, uh, and we slapped it in there and, and got ready to be really excited. Turned the key, and we got the most glorious sound that I've heard in a long time, and that is bop bop. In this area, I'm used to hearing that like when deals go bad, but it was actually just, you know, some ignition. So we have spark. I wish the story ended there, but it doesn't. <laughs> because after we got the pop pop, we never got a run run. So it was getting spark, but very obviously not at the right time. Like I could hear, my ear told me that it was igniting basically when the cylinder, when the valves were open. So something was really wrong. So at that point, it was time to investigate the distributor because there was no telling if somebody had taken that out and not put it correctly back in time. It's hard to get these things not 180 degrees out. It's really hard to get them not 180 degrees out when there's eight spark plugs for four cylinders. In fact, I did it twice. <laughs> I pulled the shooter out, stabbed it back in, had everything what I thought was lined up, lined it up to the crank pulley, thought everything was golden, and had nothing. But eventually, we got there. Eventually, we got all of them hooked up correctly, and we got, you know, we got all the spark plug leads hooked up correctly, and we got the engine at and we got the engine at actual top dead center, lined up to number one, which conveniently, by the way, is pretty much where the screws are. So at top dead center, you wanted it pointing at this screw, which was very handy. But um, yeah, it, it do thing now. Should we do have a do thing? We should have a do thing. Will it do thing? I don't know. It's not gonna do good things because it's got other issues. Don't get me wrong. A, I don't even have the mass airflow hooked in, so it's just going to be in limp mode. Also, there's a little bit of a leak in the boost pipe between the turbo and the intake. But regardless, it should just start up an idle. Like, at this point, that's what it should do. So it's going to be unhappy, it's going to be all bodily because it's in limp mode and has vacuum leaks. But it do the thing! and turned off to not asphyxiate myself. There we go. I make this video for two reasons. Number one, I wanted to kind of showcase our thoughts on it, like how we went through it, the method in which we arrived to a conclusion, because it wasn't an easy one. I need to open the door. I ran this thing for like 20 seconds and I am lightheaded. <laughs> it's cold out there though. Um, so yeah, there's, there's a certain, method to the madness there. And hopefully, if you're out there and trying to get something like this running, it shows you a little bit of the process and, and maybe how to go through it. Could we have done things differently? Yeah, we could have. Would it have mattered in the end? No, because sometimes throwing parts at it is actually what you have to do. Because sometimes actually every part of something is broken. The number two reason I wanted to make this video is because if you ever are really just like, man, that car on Marketplace says it just needs this, and it'll be a runner. Don't believe it. Don't just be like, oh, that car just needs a fuel pump? Well, I can get that car for $5,000 less than, than, you know, a running one. Oh, this is going to be great. No, 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 no. Nothing that can be easily fixed is ever sold. If it can be easily fixed, someone would fix it and sell it for the right price. <laughs> If it don't run, don't believe that it's going to be easy to get it fixed. 
I am so happy, though, to hear this thing run. I think this car has not run for this reason for a long time. And it's time to show you what I think the reason is. Why in the world would this car fry an ECU, two coil igniters, pro probably more, uh, a crank angle sensor, and, you know, just cause so much headache? You see that wire dangling down? It's got a little resistor bobby at the bottom. You see that alternator? Do you see that, you know, obvious aftermarket eye connector on the intake manifold? That wire, instead of being hooked up to the alternator on both sides, was hooked to the alternator positive lead. Somebody fried this car. <laughs> Somebody fried all of this stuff by incorrectly hooking up the alternator. I am almost certain. Whether or not they had it hooked up that way, or whether or not that wire has just been chilling and dangling, which is also very possible. I went ahead and disconnected everything on the alternator so it couldn't happen again. But um, yeah, I'm, I'm almost certain, and it matches the symptoms so well, somebody fried the ignition system on this car by doing something here with the alternator wiring. Because if you send 12 volts to the intake manifold metal, well, guess what's grounded to that intake manifold? Just about everything. And you know what? I'm not upset or mad or anything. It's just, it's part of the process of cars. Like sometimes stuff happens and you just never, you never know. You never know what could happen in, you know, the fallout of that. I've blown fuses and done stuff like that many times in my past. And, and you know, shit happens. But thankfully... It seems like we've got it fixed. So now I'm going to put the exhaust side coil in here and to get it together, mount that into the car, get the exhaust spark plugs changed, put those wires on, put it all back together. I'm going to cut this short and put an actual silicone seal on here instead of the factory grommet seal that is obviously gone. Uh, and then we're going to see if this thing's like actually a good runner. But there you go. I probably missed something. I didn't do so much editing on this to try and make any sense of it. And uh, I should probably make an actual video specifically about the coil change or the igniter change, I mean. Maybe. Maybe someday in the future I'll do that. But uh, if you ever, if you're out there someday in the future and you're trying to do this to yours, please feel free to message me. I will help you and uh, hopefully it helps your problem too. But that will do it for today. Thank you as always for watching. And I'll see you next time, hopefully with more fun stuff on the 200, including, you know, getting it moving. That'd be sweet.